John Hockenberry. There's so much we could say about him. He's a journalist, he's an author, a presenter with a rich and varied history in all media, from traditional broadcast to newspapers, magazines, books, and the web. It's intimidating to have a gentleman like him around, working in the business as I do, to have him having accomplished so much and me so little. He is just a great giant in our, com in our community in the media world. Those assignments have brought him to the conflict zones around the world, including Somalia, Iraq, Lebanon, Jerusalem, Tehran, Zaire, Romania, the Balkans, Russia, India, Afghanistan, as well as major important domestic stories right here in the United States. He is tireless. He is the energizer bunny of media. Holder of four Emmy Awards and four Peabody Awards for journalism, he is also a celebrated speaker, a high-profile advocate for social justice, and for the rights of people with disabilities. He has argued for disability rights at the United Nations and at the White House. There is so much we could tell you about him. We're going to let him tell you about himself and tell you about the great causes that he's been involved in, the adventures that he's had. Ladies and gentlemen, our keynoter, John Hockenberry. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. What a thrill to be here. Thanks so much, Phil. Uh, Phil and I were once members uh, in our little community, media community, in the, in the NBC family. And we both found out how much their fam family there is at uh, NBC. He's now at Fox, and I'm you know, b uh, back in public radio. It's a, it's a tough world out there. Um, but uh, as a former uh, NBC family member, we are brothers for life, that's for sure. It's great to be here. So many fabulous people. Thanks so much to uh, uh, Dr. Wheeler's lovely remarks, sweet remarks. I wasn't expecting that. Although, you know, I, I spent some time here. I've got some dear friends from college here in Kansas City, and they took me to the Savoy Grill last night. So I heard all about Harry Truman, you know, and Steven Spielberg was there. And uh, those waiters know everybody uh, who's ever walked through that place. But, you know, I, I, I think I got a little bit of... Uh, the sort of Charles Wheeler thing uh, by eating at the Savoy, because I'm sure he spent some time there. And uh, I, I went, went home last night, I kind of had a, had a terrifying dream, and Wheeler was in it. Um, <laughs> I was on this plane, right? And, uh, and, and all of a sudden, the flight attendant comes out of the cockpit and says, oh my god, the pilot's collapsed. We need a doctor. Is there a doctor on the plane? And then she goes, wait a minute, the pilot's collapsed? We need a pilot. Is there a pilot on the plane? And Wheeler stands up. He's in the front row. He says, will you make up your mind? I can help you out, but what do you need, a pilot or a doctor? <laughs> it gives you a sense of security to know that Wheeler's in the room. You know what I mean? Um, and, and I was hearing uh, Wheeler and, and Cox talking uh, earlier, Danny Cox, who's great. What, what a fabulous <laughs> song. <laughs> and whose idea was it that I have to follow Danny Cox? Jeez. Um, but uh, Co Cox and Wheeler, that's a show. That's a TV show. That's, a, that's something. We, we're going to see that on, on Channel 4, I think. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's great. I'm going to tell you a few stories about uh, the, the length of time that I've spent in this disability community. It wasn't a community I joined by choice, but it's a place that I think has a message for the rest of, of America and the world, a message that is universal, and I want to explore that a little bit. I mean, when I began uh, as a paraplegic uh, back in the 70s, uh, I was told by, uh, by a doctor, well-meaning doctor at a facility that uh, there's no way you're going to be able to have kids, and uh, I remember this, this uh, shrink, put underneath the door of my room a stack of papers. He couldn't actually answer the question, am I going to be able to have kids? Uh, but, but he put a stack of papers under, and I took them to bed one night at the rehab facility and, and read, and it sort of said, no, I guess, is uh, the state of research. And I went up to him afterward and I said, didn't you have the guts to just sort of tell me? And he said, well, I, you know, it, it's sort of, we don't know what the situation is. Uh, uh, you know, we can hope, but uh, basically, uh, you know, you're probably going to have to look forward to not having kids biologically. And uh, of course, I have five biological kids now. Um, 
or, or I guess, or I guess as you say here in Kansas City, that's about half a Grissomore, right? Uh, <laughs> a little starter family. <laughs> um, Kansas City, of course, it's no accident that there would be a, a place with such passion for advocacy here. I mean, this is a, a place filled with, with hope. Um, Royals fans have to hope, I guess. <laughs> it's not much else for them to do. Uh, Chiefs fans, it's a little better for them. Um, but as a fan of the New York Giants, the Super Bowl champion New York Giants, um, <laughs> It's always a thrill because we know we can count on the Chiefs coming to New York and humiliating the Jets, which I love. Uh, and uh, we certainly thank you all here in Kansas City for that. Um, you know, the, the architecture piece of this story is one of the reasons I'm here. And the renovation of your facility uh, there on Main Street, I think, is a very important story that isn't just about architecture and it isn't just about urban renewal, something we used to talk about back in the 1970s. It's, it's something way more important than all of that. I mean, I think, you know, raising the profile of this building, um, I, I think, is a really great piece of, first of all, raising the profile of advocacy of people with disabilities. I mean, in a sense, what uh, uh, the whole person is doing is, is, is delivering a message, you know, wear your underwear on the outside. You know, that's kind of the message here of this building, raising the profile of an underwear factory to really deliver a message that a community here involved in advocacy is, is something that we need to celebrate. It's not something hidden away. It's not a sort of a fringe objective of our community. This is, is a development and a mission that is core to the whole operation of democracy. Why do we love accessible architecture? Why do we love places that are ramped, that have wide doors, that are open, that, that allow use by all kinds of people, the so-called universal design message that will be embodied in this building, but is more and more found in places all over the world? We like it. We're comfortable in places like this because they're welcoming. They suggest that the people who designed this building thought hard about who was going to use this building thought hard about the kinds of people that will visit this building and use this building and be in this place. When institutions deliver that message, it's a powerful, positive message that binds us together. And it's not about disability. It's about democracy. When I was uh, first starting out in the business uh, of uh, being a, a radio reporter, you know, I had to really be concerned about certain basic aspects of life. Uh, as I was cruising around, you know, I'd have to file my uh, radio pieces using pay phones. Remember, remember those? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was actually long ago. Um, but uh, things are changing so rapidly. And getting a wheelchair into a phone booth was very, very difficult. So I had to come up with innovative ways to get a phone. I remember convincing an a office uh, assistant principal in an elementary school to use their phone to make a long distance, remember those, phone call uh, back to Washington to file a story on the Mount St. Helens volcano. Um, you had to really be innovative. You had to figure out how you were going to solve a problem because the world around you hadn't thought about how a guy in a wheelchair as a reporter was going to be able to file his story use the telephone. The world hadn't thought about it yet, so it was up to you to think about it and solve the problems on your own. It was amazing to me when I would solve my problems that people would kind of go, that's cool, that's great, that's clever. You know? But there's only, you know, we, we think about people with disabilities as somehow living some special narrative. And maybe it is. Um, but maybe a better way to think about it is that it's not special at all, that, that in fact, we need to celebrate the collective problem-solving abilities of all of us. There's only one difference between a person with a disability and a person who has any number of so-called normal person problems in our American democracy, and that is the level of urgency of those individual problems. Uh, I remember when I was at National Public Radio, you know, they're, they're you know, progressive, you know, lefty types, right? You know, you, you hear that on Fox all the time, right? The, the, 
Um, but did they have accessible bathrooms? No, back in the 80s. No, you know, I would go to them and I'd say, you know, I need, uh, I, I worked in the Chicago Bureau and I worked in Washington and in either place was there an accessible bathroom. And I'd say, you know, it's kind of important as an employee to be able to use the bathroom. I mean, I used to go down the street to a community college in Chicago and use the bathroom there, um, which was a nice break from my office uh, on Michigan Avenue, but it wasn't terribly convenient. <laughs> And I would address this issue with my employers, and they, and they would say, well, John, you know, we're National Public Radio, right? We're, we're on the right side of this. Uh, <laughs> we're working on it, you know? I would say, well, I mean, I, I gotta go, okay? <laughs> um, it's that level of urgency that means the problem needs to be worked on now. This isn't something we are gonna get to, even if you just, heart of gold, lefty, whatever is that they thought they were at National Public Radio, you're missing the boat. You're not solving the problem, you're not doing it. You gotta do it, you gotta solve it. I remember when I was on the road, uh, I used to uh, use uh, hospital emergency rooms. They would always have accessible bathrooms when I was like uh, cruising around doing a story. And I would, I, when I would get into town, I'd locate the emergency room and they'd always had a ramp, right, for the stretcher. And when you go in, you go right past the nurse, and they were always like the same architect, I think, made every emergency room uh, back in the 80s. And, uh, and, and you'd, you'd zoom in, you'd come up the ramp, you'd zoom in, you'd go past the nurse's station, and just past the nurse's station was one of those big, huge, oh my God, whatever is gonna happen, we can handle it here in this bathroom. <laughs> bathroom, you know? <clears throat> and I always had like a big drain in the middle, you know? And, and it was totally accessible. And I knew where that sucker was. I'd come back, I'd, I'd, and, and because I was in a wheelchair, I kind of looked like a patient, you know? <laughs> so I'd cruise up the ramp, past the nurse's station. Before that nurse could do it, uh, I was in the bathroom with the door shut. <laughs> Clever. Solving those problems. Um, the, uh, the, the era in which I began as a paraplegic was an era in which it was unusual to be out and disabled. It was unusual to be out there in the community. And, and this level of unusualness was both an asset and a problem. I mean, it was a problem because I had to solve all these problems on my own. And occasionally you'd go, well, you know, I'm in an Olympic event where there's no medals here. I kind of wish somebody else was working on this along with me. And gradually over time, as I would meet other people with disabilities who had their own problem-solving skills and had figured out how to do the things that I was trying to figure out in their own ways, and we began to share our collective expertise. And we began, oh, and I know somebody who does a great, and he uses this grabber, and oh, have you seen Steve's cool car? And, he's, and as the technology began to improve, and as the community and the people at the various disability campfires around the United States would wave to each other and send the smoke signals and say, hey, you know what? We got a great solution to that. And sure enough, the independent living movement was born with the combination of problem solving and radicalism and we're not going to accept this situation and democracy, it all came about. But there's nothing unusual about that story. The level of urgency is a little different, but it's democracy in action. It's what we should be doing in our communities. It's what our institutions should be doing. Of course, there was a, a positive side to the being sort of the unusual, only disabled person in the crew uh, situation. I was over in Somalia, I remember, and, and uh, during the terrible famine that took place in the early 90s, and uh, Somalia was an absolutely lawless, institutionless, governmentless. There was no civic life whatsoever over in Somalia. It was, it was wretched. There would be one village where people were starving, where virtually all the children were dying in dozens. And then the next village, everyone was, was healthy and well-fed. And you just you know, you, you couldn't even begin to judge the situation there because you would just go, oh my what is it these people have lost that this village over here would be fine and this village over here would be dying? And you would ask these people, well, maybe you should, 
you know, and, and they would just look at you like, you know, what do you want us to do here? We're, we're trying, all trying to survive. And you realize that's what they lost, this sense of civic bonding that told them that as a nation they were all in this together. Once you lose that, you lose everything. And the militias that ran that country, we ran afoul of them as an ABC uh, TV crew back then. And I remember um, you know, these teenagers running around with these unbelievable weapons, rocket-propelled grenades, these, uh, grenade, these Schwarzenegger grenade launchers that these, uh, there was this one little kid, um, he, was, he was like 11 years old, he had a t-shirt that said boss on it, and he carried an M60 grenade uh, launcher, and, and he was the boss. Uh, oh yeah, you weren't arguing with him at all, but, but they were still kids. And I remember uh, at one point our uh, sound man picked up a camera, always a bad idea in television, you know this, Phil, um, and took a picture of a wreck of a, of a fighter jet that was on the runway at the Baidoa airport in Somalia. And all of a sudden, the local militia guy, guy probably in his early 20s, a total psychopath, uh, in a very colorful shirt, you know, suddenly decided to make this a, a, a problem, that you took a picture without our approval. And, uh, and uh, be, got, got into an argument with the sound man, the sound man saying, look, I was just taking a picture for a souvenir. And he said, no, 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 you violated our security here at this airport that this militia controlled, which was passing for civic life in Somalia, a place of total chaos, and he whips out his weapons, and all of a sudden he whistles, and two dozen boys with RPGs surround our Jeep, and my pregnant producer uh, sitting next to me starts to weep. My, the color drains from the sound guy's face. Uh, my uh, cameraman goes, oh, we're, we're screwed now. And, and I'm looking at this Jeep being surrounded by these boys with these RPGs, and, and uh, I, I uh, am sitting in this, in this vehicle going, all right, this, this has to stop now. And so for some reason, I just thought to myself, all right, I've had enough of this. I open the door, and I just fling myself out. I can't stand up. I just fling myself up on the ground, and I scream, put those down! Get those idiots to put those RPGs down. I've had enough of this. We're done, all right? Put down the weapons right now. I said now. And the cameraman's looking at me going, oh, we're dead. Oh, we're dead. I'm just screaming. And all of a sudden, this paraplegic flopping around, the wheelchair was on top of the Jeep, so everybody knew what was going on here. And all these kids with their RPGs start laughing hysterically. <laughs> Oh, uh, this guy, he goes here, he put the weapon down. Oh, that was, uh, you tried to see him, he jump out. Of the... <laughs> and sure enough, we were saved, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Only because some guy in a wheelchair has to speak up when everybody else is kind of sitting there going, oh, we're dead, we're dead, you know. It's always going to be the disability guy that, like, mouths <laughs> off, right? You know, nowadays, you're not that unusual anymore. I mean, I, don't, I couldn't count on being able to save myself with that. I look much more like an American, like a regular, you know, they've seen people in wheelchairs. They, they understand that this sort of disability community is out and in the world. My uniqueness is not something I can necessarily uh, count on. Um, I remember uh, my wheelchair repair dude in Chicago when I was in the Chicago Bureau at NPR was a fellow named Ian, and I would go to his house, and people from all over the Chicagoland area would come to Ian's house with various you know, installations of custom uh, equipment. They'd buy wheels from him. They'd buy cushions from him. Uh, he would do repair stuff, and their, their house was this just huge kind of dump of uh, wheelchair components, and it was great. And he had two, three able-bodied kids. His wife w was in a wheelchair. And, you know, they were on the street, and it just it, people would show up. I would show up in these vans with lifts, and people would get out. they get their chairs fixed. And, and I remember Ian, Ian's kid uh, gets to be uh, in first grade, <clears throat> and he goes off to public school. And Ian told me this hysterical story about his kid comes home one day um, after... Uh, uh, going for the first week, I guess it was, to public school for the first time, bus picked him up, he went to school, came home. And of course, you know, smart kid, 
and kids observe things, and, and he's sitting around the dining room table, and he says to his, to his dad and mom, um, you know, dad and mom, um, I, I, ju I just want you to know uh, that, you know, out there in the world, um, I've noticed that there aren't a lot of uh, wheelchairs out there, you know, and, and of course, there, in their world, it's like wheelchairs all the time. Everybody's got a wheelchair. And, and this, this little kid was, was sort of observing that, you know, most people don't have wheelchairs out there. I, and, and, and I just, have you noticed that? You know, and the, the kid was actually being protective of his mom and dad and, and of people like me. You know, you know, I've been out there in the world, and I just, you know, I just want to remind you guys in the wheelchairs that there aren't a lot of you out there. Um, <laughs> And so just bear that in mind. Uh, I'm a first grader, uh, but I just thought I'd give you that information, you know, in case you needed it. And, and consider his point of view. You know, he grew up in a household where there were wheelchairs everywhere. He noticed the absence of this community. That balance is beginning to balance out. There is not necessarily a, a sense that this is a tiny minority that's away and out of view. And it's thanks to the independent living movement, it's thanks to organizations like this, it's thanks to you that have made these communities have more visibility and to allow people to see the actions of democracy. Um, I'll tell you a, a couple of stories, uh, one from my reporting and then one just from my uh, personal family life uh, that really brings back uh, the, the sense of, of why an architecture of diversity and universal design and welcoming, and why the institutional decision to make your community work for the people who are actually going to use it is the core reason why democracy is such a powerful way of organizing civilization. Uh, I spent some time in Romania um, after the uh, end of the Cold War, as the Cold War ended and the Ceausescu regime uh, was overthrown by a coup d'etat, essentially, and there's, uh, uh, it's the one place in uh, Eastern Europe that has not benefited from the democracy that, of course, uh, wiped out the uh, uh, Warsaw Pact uh, uh, arrangement with the Soviet Union and eventually brought the Soviet Union down. But all over Romania, there were huge government buildings that had been put up by Nicolae Ceausescu and the dictator, and, and the people who lived in Romania had no connection with their government whatsoever except to be afraid of it. Or, and, and the fear was one thing, but the thing that was so striking to me was, was how they, they didn't understand why it was this way. It was a landscape of cities and towns and villages and, and infrastructure that was so fundamentally unwelcoming to them and they didn't know why it was this way. And the people of Romania would ask me, you know, we don't know how it got this way. Will things ever get better? And, you know, why were they asking me? I, mean, I don't know anything about Romania. I mean, I was reporting about Romania. But the fact that they would even ask that they had come so to the end of their own sense of hope because they were so alienated from the institutions that were supposed to be nurturing them. There was no one asking the question, how will we live here in Romania? How will we make it? so that the people who are actually here can thrive. No one ever did that. Yet I went to Zaire in almost the same era, at a, a, a place that was also filled with dictatorship and chaos, where the government was, was non-functioning. And I remember around the corner in a very uh, you know, down the street, poor community of Zaire, was a, a community of people with disabilities, uh, six or seven young guys who had been injured in various uh, local civil war battles, gunshot wounds, and, and other just injuries, car accidents, and had virtually no access to any assistive technology to help them, no access to the kinds of wheelchairs that, that we would have. And, and I rolled down the street and saw them in their improvised wheelchairs that they'd made themselves, and they were so excited to see me. They wanted to share what they'd done, look at my chair, see the technology that I had used and, and show off the technology they had used. And I went into this community of three or four houses, more like huts, but they were completely accessible. They had been designed to, to allow the people in them, despite their physical disabilities, to thrive. And here, within this dictatorship, 
were people who had taken matters into their own hands because of the urgency of the disability need. All right, we're going to solve this problem. And there in the middle of Zaire was this little democratic disability community that had solved their own problems, that understood why things were the way they were because they had made it themselves. And it's a lesson that we need to remind ourselves. We need to make our own world. We need to understand that the world, that the taxes that we're paying, that the infrastructure we create, that our relationship with government, if it's not about people thriving, communities thriving, real people thriving, then it's not about anything. In my family, my uncle, Charlie is his name, had uh, PKU, a metabolic disorder that was untreatable until the 1950s. Uh, and, and he was profoundly mentally retarded and uh, because the prevailing notion at the time was, well, you can't have people that retarded in the same house as your non-retarded normal kids. You can't do that. That's, that's inappropriate. It's going to somehow degrade their, their uh, upbringing. The decision was made by my grandparents that he would go into an institution. And I never knew of his existence, really. I knew that he'd been born, and I knew that there was some sort of scandal and that he had gone away. And when I wrote my first book back in the 90s, I asked my mother, when did he die? And my mother said, no, he's not dead. He's alive. And he lives in an institution, and here's the address. And if you'd like, you could go see him. And all of a sudden, here I am, disabled individual, learning of an individual in my family who's also disabled, but the connection has been denied us for reasons that have to do with this, well, disabled people really shouldn't be a part of our community because it would somehow degrade the rest of us. And here's somebody, you know, at this time I'd been in my paraplegic life for about 20 years, and at no time had any member of my family, you know, put a ramp on their house or, you know, I mean, my parents modified one house bathroom. So when I would come to visit, basically I was living in inaccessibility and I, you know, I didn't quite know what to say to them. I mean, they would help me up the stairs. They were all very nice, but nobody had an accessible house. I didn't hold it against them. And I also felt it was a little uncomfortable for me to ask, you know, maybe you guys should get a ramp or something. Love my family, but it just seemed like a little too much to ask somehow. I only visit once, be too expensive. You know the excuses, you've heard the excuses. So I decided to go visit Charlie in this institution. I have no idea what my relationship will be with him. I have no idea if I'm even doing something a little creepy. You know, I didn't show up at any other time. None of our family has ever shown up. I have no connection to this man. He may not even know who the heck I am. He's that profoundly retarded, according to the reports. So with profound misgivings, I'm rolling down the road to see Charlie and I roll up to the address, and sure enough, for the first time in my life, a member of my family has a door that opens automatically with a ramp that goes right in, a completely accessible facility, of course, that he lives in. It was one of the most profoundly moving experiences of my life because it said, of course, I have a connection to him. He's my uncle. Of course, he's welcoming me. He's my uncle. He's a disabled person, but he's my uncle. He's a citizen of our community. And look what they've created here. This infrastructure that welcomes me, that allows me to thrive. And of course, we had a great afternoon and spent many afternoons after that together. Um, the connection was solid that I would have ever thought for a moment that it didn't exist. Absurd. And that, of course, is our mission here in the uh, independent living movement, creating in our communities, in our institutions, this social compact which says we are creating places for people to thrive, programs that, that help people with disabilities. Some of them mentioned here in the state of, uh, of Missouri today, uh, programs that are under fire in the state of Kansas today. Let me read a quote. See if you can guess who uh, wrote this to his brother back in the 1950s. Because this is really about the service-driven mission of government that should be at the core of uh, why we go into public service 
and why we, we even pay taxes or vote. This is what democracy is all about. Should any political party attempt to abolish social security, unemployment insurance, and eliminate labor laws and farm programs, you would not hear of that party again in our political history. There's a tiny splinter group, of course, that believes you can do these things. Among them are H.L. Hunt, a few other Texas oil millionaires, and an occasional politician or businessman from other areas. Their number is negligible, and they are stupid. Does anyone have any idea who said that back in 1954? Dwight Eisenhower, yes. Dwight Eisenhower. And he wasn't describing people today as stupid. And don't misunderstand me. He was saying that what we do, the consensus that we develop, to create this sort of social compact with the people in our community whose level of urgency is all over the map. The problems that need to be solved today, the people that need to go in an hour, the, the solutions to community-based problems that maybe need to be resolved this year or next. This is what government is about. This is what we're doing. If we're arguing about something else, if we're playing a numbers game with the budget and not doing what it is we're supposed to be doing in our communities to make people thrive, designing the places to be where we can live comfortably, welcomingly. If we're not doing that, then we're doing nothing. So your mission here is universal. There's nothing fringe about what you're doing. This is democracy in action, ladies and gentlemen. I congratulate all of you, and thank you so much for letting me spend some time with you this afternoon.